Okay, um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Philip Lücke um, as today's speaker. Um, we actually uh, um, overlapped for some time in Münster when he uh, got his master's and uh, then later his PhD thesis under the supervision of Ralf Schindler. And um, then he uh, went to Bonn for a while and currently he is in Barcelona on an EU stipend. Um, and so he's going to talk today about uh, Magador style embedding characterizations of large cardinals. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, so greetings from Barcelona. Uh, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to, to speak in your seminar. I will talk about some, some work that I did after I arrived uh, in Barcelona and, uh, and some some characterizations of large cardinals and some applications. Okay, so let me do a brief overview of uh, the content and please feel free to stop me um, if you have questions. Okay, so I would start by uh, showing you Magido's characterization of supercompactness because this is kind of the starting point of the work I did. And then uh, I will show you an application to uh, combinatorial set theory, so namely to strong chain conditions. And um, after this, I will talk about the large cardinal property that might not be too well known. It's called Schrute cardinals introduced by Michael Ratchen. And um, then I will show you some variations of the arguments that where I use super compactness and uh, instead use something much, much uh, weaker. And then I will talk about another variation of this, uh, uh, of these embedding characterizations, uh, something called weakly fruit cardinals and um, apply them to questions about structural reflection. So these are kind of generalized Litten and Skolem theorems. Um, and this will also allow me to say something about the weakly compact embedding property introduced by Hemkins and something about uh, that also concerns uh, results of Hemkins and his collaborators about non reflection properties of cardinal invariants of the continuum. Okay, so let's start with um, Magido's characterization of supercompactness. This is a quite classical result. I think it's actually from his PhD thesis. And his result says that some cardinal kappa is super compact if and only if for every larger cardinal theta and for every element of the corresponding H theta, we can find smaller cardinals, so kappa bar less than theta bar less than kappa, and some embedding from H theta bar to theta, H theta, where kappa bar is a critical point and the critical point gets sent to kappa and this element I picked in the beginning, this will be in the range of this embedding. And so you, this is equivalent to the same statement without the parameter, <laughs> but it's kind of easier to work with the things when you phrase it this way. Okay, and just, uh, to make things a bit easier to remember. So what's the picture for this? It's the following. So kind of the, the one picture there is in set theory. Um, so uh, on the right, we have this H theta, so some initial segment of the universe and the super compact cardinal in there, kappa, and then we have a smaller initial segment of the universe, H theta bar. And now it's important that theta bar is smaller than kappa. And then the embedding where the critical point kappa bar gets sent to kappa. Okay, so this is the picture you should keep in mind. And so this is equivalent to the normal definition of supercompactness. But for a lot of applications, this is easier to, to work with and it kind of captures this reflection properties of supercompactness better than the, the usual definition. Okay. And now, what can we do with this? So I will want to consider some combinatorial problem. And this is motivated by the following basic fact. 
So if you have a weakly compact cardinal, then the kappa chain condition is actually um, equivalent to the kappa cluster property. So the so kappa chain condition means if you have kappa many elements of your partial order, then there are two of them which are compatible. And uh, kappa cluster means there are kappa many which are pairwise compatible. Mm -hmm. And um, this directly implies that at weakly compact cardinal, the kappa chain condition is productive. So if you have two kappa CC forcings, then their product is also kappa CC. And this is because the product of a kappa cluster and a kappa CC forcing is again kappa CC. Okay, so we have some nice combinatorial property at weak compactness, and there's a famous open problem uh, or question by Todorovic, which asks, um, if you look at cardinals bigger than omega one and the kappa chain condition is productive, does this imply weak compactness? And you have to say bigger than omega one because for omega one, you get it from Martin's axiom. And this is actually um, a very interesting open problem. And there are very deep results that get a lot of fragments of weak compactness from this assumption. Um, so I think you get something like Marlowe Cardinal plus stationary reflection. So the, the consistency strength is a weak compact cardinal, but it's not known um, whether uh, you actually get direct implication to weak compactness. And for example, I think like the case omega two is quite hard, and so there are various results by Shelar, Todorovic, and uh, as of Renaud. Okay, and what I want to consider is the more general question. So this is the question whether you can characterize large cardinal properties by the statement that the kappa chain condition is equivalent to some property that's a general strong love in the kappa chain condition. So, so for the Dodgers question, it, it would be whether uh, kappa CC is the same as productively kappa CC. Okay, and now what do we want to look at here? So I need one uh, general definition. So we take some partial order, and then we say a suborder is regular if the inclusion map compares incompatibility and maximal antichains in the suborder are maximal in the, in the bigger partial order. And then there's a property introduced by Sean Cox, which says that some partial order is stationary layered if the collection of regular suborders of size less than kappa is stationary at p kappa the partial order and stationary in the sense of yes. Um, and so you have many, many regular suborders. And then uh, Sean showed that stationary layeredness implies clusters. So in particular, it's a strengthening of um, the chain condition, the kappa chain condition. And so what we did together is that this actually uh, stationary layeredness can be used to characterize weak compactness. So we showed that some cardinal is weakly compact if and only if the kappa chain condition is actually equivalent to stationary layeredness. Um, and what you basically look at is our forcings that specialize iron shine trees and to show that they are not stationary layered. Okay. And so what is interesting for this talk is now the observation that for the forward direction of this equivalence, you actually prove something stronger. So what you prove is the following. Um, so now let's take our kappa, so some regular cardinal and some larger uh, lambda and consider some subset of P kappa lambda. And then we say a partial order of size of most lambda is F layer, so F is a subset of P kappa lambda. If so, basically, so whenever I take a subjection from lambda onto onto P, then the the small subsets of of lambda um, 
where the point blast image is a regular suborder, these are, oh, there's a, there's a break, um, something missing here. Uh, so the regular suborders uh, are in the set F. So you should think of the F as a filter. Right, so, um, so something is F layered if for, for, for many, uh, for many elements, it's layer, it's uh, it's a regular suborder, and then we showed that if you have a normal filter on Pika Valanda and some poset is is layered with respect to this filter, then this implies Kappa stationary layered, so it implies cluster and it implies uh, Kappa CC. And what our proof shows that is that um, if you look at um, partial orders of size kappa, then these things are layered with respect to the weakly compact filter. So, you I mean, you have to define it on P kappa kappa. So, we showed that there is a normal filter on P kappa kappa such that every kappa CC partial order that satisfies the kappa chain condition. So, this is layered with respect to this filter. And, uh, Philip? like the could, yes. I, could I just ask quick in the notation this for the the collection of regular suborders of p this kappa what what does that mean reg reg kappa of p this is the uh, the suborders of size less than kappa oh I see okay all right Thank yeah you. so you uh, look at subsets of p of size less than kappa that are regular suborders right okay thank you all right. yeah. another it says normal ultra filter. Uh, I believe oh, it just sorry. normal filter, right? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, it should. Yeah, yeah. This should be okay. filter, right? So this, this is. Uh, if you're familiar with this, this is the uh, weekly compact. Yeah. Don't want to prove the weekly compact cardinals. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So okay. Normal filter. Oh, sorry. Could I ask? Um, did you say that um, kappa stationarily layered implies kappa chain condition? Yes, okay. it implies uh, a cluster, and this implies capacity. Actually, as long as you've been interrupted repeatedly, let me repeat the interruption. Is yeah. this normal filter F sub W C the one that's associated that the pi one one indescribable filter, or is this some other filter that gets? Uh, this is uh, this is this. Uh, it's a weekly compact filter, but it's okay. you have to define it on P kappa kappa instead of. Kappa, yeah, so, okay. but, uh, so it's not literally the weekly compact filter, but it's basically the compact right. weekly it, compact it's filter. It's trying to be. <laughs> yes. Okay. 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 So, and uh, in general, being layered with respect to some uh, stationary, uh, with respect to some normal filter, this is stronger than being stationary layered. Because it's it's productive, right? Because I mean, you have to show it, but it's it's productive and being stationary layered. Um, it might not be productive because you can be um, layered on the stationary set and it's stationary complement, and then you cannot show that it's productive, right? So filter layered should be stronger than stationary layered. Okay, and now so this works for for kappa out of using weak compactness and now a natural question would be so if you look at filters on um, P kappa lambda for larger lambdas um, and you ask about being layered with respect to a normal filter on P kappa lambda does this give you stronger large cardinal properties and you can get it from something stronger than the from super compactness and now I will phrase this in a way that uses Magidor's uh, characterization. So, so fix some lambda and some regular kappa. And now we define this collection F kappa lambda. Uh, so this will be a filter if kappa is super compact. So this consists of all subsets A of P kappa lambda. Now with the property that I can fix some set Z, some parameter, and then the just unfold this. So whenever I take such a uh, embedding given by this Magidor characterization, and this parameter Z is in the range of this embedding, then 
the point was image of um, of the the ordinals intersected with London. This will be in um, in A in these sets in the filter. Okay, so if you look at this for a while, then this will basically be the intersection of all filters witnessing lambda supercompactness. Yeah, so uh, so this it's possible that this is not an ultra filter, but it uh, this can be a, uh, is a filter if you are uh, super compact. Okay, so it's easier to think about this is if lambda has a pre-image in this uh, in this embedding. So then it's just the pointless image of the pre-image of lambda uh, if this is in your set A. Yeah, so it's the large sets. Okay, and then it's not too hard to show that um, if kappa is super compact, then this is a normal filter. And it actually, it always have, has all properties of a normal filter except for being non-trivial. And to show that the empty set is not in there, this is just lambda super compactness. So, so you have to show that for, this is Magadus characterization, right? For every Z, there is a, such a thing where Z is in the range. So the empty set is not in there. Um, Okay, and then it's also not too hard to show that um, if you have a, a partial order of size lambda that satisfies the kappa chain condition, then it's actually layered with respect to this coll uh, collection. Yeah, so uh, I will show the proof on the next slide. But so this means if kappa is lambda super compact, then you have a normal filter on p kappa lambda where all kappa cc process are layered. Okay, let me briefly show you the proof. Um, so what you have to show is that you are in the following situation. So you have this Magido embedding. So try to remember this picture. And now the partial order is in the range of this embedding. And it has a pre-image Q. And then you look at the suborder given by the point plus image of Q. And if you can show that this is a regular suborder, then if you look at the definition of layeredness, then you have shown that um, the the forcing is layered with respect to this filter. Right. So, so what you have to show, so your Q is a pre-image of P under such a Magido embedding, and you have to show that the point bias image is a regular suborder. Okay, so you have to show that maximal antichains in the point bias image are maximal antichains in P. And just by elementarity, and because the, the models are initial segments of the universe, uh, you know that since P satisfies the kappa chain condition, Q satisfies the kappa bar chain condition. Because all the, um, if you pick theta, right? So, um, okay. And then if you take a maximal antichain in the point as image of Q, then, um, since the domain of the embedding was an initial segment of the universe, its pre-image will be an element of this H theta bar and it's a maximal antichain in Q. But now Q has the kappa bar chain condition, so this uh, antichain is small. And actually, uh, the image of this maximal antichain under the embedding is the same as a point wise image because it's smaller than the critical point. Right. So elementarity says you that this point bias image is actually a maximal anti-chain in the big forcing. Okay, so this is just some, some short example how you can use this Magador embedding to, uh, to get reflection. Okay, so now, um, so Sean and I showed this in our paper and then we ask whether the, this filter layeredness characterizes strong or large garden properties. So what we ask if, if you have a normal filter on P kappa kappa plus, where all kappa CC forcings are layered on, is kappa a measurable cardinal? I mean, we 
kind of an arbitrary choice. So you could also ask if it's Kappa plus super compact or something like this. And um, Brent Cody gave a negative answer to this. So he showed that if uh, Kappa is nearly Kappa plus super compact, so I won't tell you what this is, I will just tell you why this answers the question, then there is a filter on P Kappa Kappa plus where all Kappa CC forcings are layered on. And there's a result by Cody, Gitte, Hamkins, and Shankar, which tells us that the first weakly compact cardinal can be nearly Kappa plus super compact. So, um, so in this model, you have layeredness with respect to a normal filter, but you are not measurable. Then. You know, just the first weakly compact cardinal. Okay, uh, but actually, the, the question uh, might not be the right question. Uh, if you look at it again, um, because I mean, to get a nearly Kappa plus super compact cardinal, you, I think you basically start with a Kappa plus super compact cardinal. So this still has high consistency strength. So the better question would be to, to ask, does the existence of such filters have high cardinal, uh, consistency strength? Okay, so maybe the better or the revised question would be whether the existence of such a filter um, where you have layeredness for a couple of CC forcing, does this give you an inner model with a measurable cardinal? Or maybe a more natural question, does it imply that uh, square couple fails? And uh, I mean, the, the, the positive answer to the second question would be, give you quite a lot of consistency strength because it give you, gives you a failure of square at a weakly compact cardinal. So this should be uh, very strong. Okay, and I actually wasted quite a lot of time trying to prove this before I found out that the answer to two thing, to both questions is no, and I will show you why. And um, uh, what I used to answer this is something uh, that Ratchin called shrewd cardinals. Okay, and this is a, a strong form of uh, indescribability. Okay, so let's start with the definition. So Ratian introduced this in some proof theoretic context that I don't really know much about. So it has something to do with ordinal notations and he kind of does something with Marlow cardinals and I think weakly compact cardinals and then he wants to go on and then he defines this property to continue the, the, the things he did with smaller large cardinals. Okay, so what he defined is, uh, he says the cardinal is shrewd. If whenever you have some uh, formula in the language of theta theory, and you have some ordinal alpha and some subset of the kappa, such that this statement, uh, so this formula holds for the parameters, the subset of the kappa and the cardinal kappa itself, and it holds in V kappa plus alpha, then there are smaller ordinals alpha bar, kappa bar, such that the corresponding statements where you now intersect A with V kappa bar and you replace kappa by kappa bar, and this now holds in V kappa bar plus alpha bar. Okay, um, so this is some strong form of indescribability. And you should notice that so kappa bar plus alpha bar is smaller than kappa. So you reflect some statement to some, some stage below kappa. And I will, on the next slide, I think I will give you the, the Magidor style characterization for this, which is, might be easier to remember than this one. Um, okay, so but what is not too hard to see is that these cardinals, they are totally indescribable and they are also stationary limits of totally indescribables. So that's a lower bound. And Ratian showed that if you had a, have a subtle cardinal, then the smaller cardinals that are shrewd in the V of the um, subtle cardinal, they are stationary in delta. Yeah, so it's below total, totally indescribable and subtle, so rather small. Um, okay, and now, so what is the um, Magidor 
style characterization for this, and it's basically the same as super compactness, but it's just an obvious, uh, just a simple modification. So, so some cardinal kappa is shrewd if and only if. So for every larger theta and every parameter z, you have smaller cardinals kappa bar th uh, theta bar below kappa. And now you have an elementary submodel x of h theta bar and an elementary embedding from this x to h theta, such that x contains uh, kappa bar as a subset and kappa bar as an element. And basically kappa bar is a critical point, but now you have to phrase it slightly different because you're no longer transitive. So the embedding on kappa bar is the identity and kappa bar gets sent to kappa, and that is in the, uh, is in the range of this embedding. So this is now the, it's the same thing as Magidor's result, but you replace the domain by an elementary submodel. Okay, and yes, you should know that this submodel is in general not transitive. It, I mean, it usually has size kappa bar. Um, and the proof also shows you that you can um, ensure that this domain is closed under less than kappa bar sequences. And you can do this because uh, shrewdness implies an inaccessibility. Okay, now just to, to remember things a bit easier, let me show you the picture for this. So this is the same picture, but now the domain is just some small elementary submodel of this H data bar. Okay. So this is the Magidor style um, characterization of shrewdness. And actually, in the things I worked on, this started as a definition, and then I realized it's the same as shrewdness. Um, and this was just because I was going through the cardinals to see where the things I defined uh, are located, and it turned out it's actually equivalent. Um, and it's not too hard, I mean, one direction to get the, the indescribability property from this embedding is quite easy, right? Because you just uh, put the parameter and the, um, the ordinals into the range, and then it does a pre-image, and so you reflect things down to this place. And the other direction is a bit, it's not complicated, but uh, you just have to be a bit careful to, to reflect the right statement. Okay. And now I, ah, so I want to show you one easy application of this embedding characterization. And for this, you have to remember what a sigma two reflecting cardinal is. So this means that the cardinal is inaccessible and the kappa is a sigma two submodel of B. So super compact cardinals have this property. But now shrewd cardinals also have this property. And uh, let me quickly show you the argument. Um, so, assume towards a contradiction that there's some sigma two statement with a parameter from B kappa that is true in B and it fails in B kappa. So, we have to get a contradiction from this. Um, so, now since it's a sigma two statement, it means that there's some H theta where the statement is true, right? So, this is just Sigma one absoluteness plus collecting the witness for the sigma two uh, truth in some H theta. Um, and now use this embedding characterization for this embedding and put the parameter into the range. Um, and then, so since root cardinals are inaccessible, the fact that kappa bar is a subset of the domain model means that B kappa bar is a subset of the domain model. And the embedding is the identity on B kappa bar. So in particular, this parameter gets mapped to itself. Um, but then uh, the statement holds an H theta bar by elementarity of the embedding plus elementarity between the domain and this H theta bar. Uh, but um, so sigma two statements are upwards absolute from H theta to V. So it holds in V and we get a contradiction. Okay, so this is an easy application. I mean, it's it's the same proof that's showing that 
super compact cardinals are um, um, have this property. Um, but you notice that you never use the, I mean, you never use the fact that the domain is, a, is really H theta bar. So it suffices to use an elementary submodel for this. Okay, so and this fact, so this statement that Schrute cardinals are sigma two reflective, and this will be important later on. Um, okay, but now we can do the same thing with the chain condition with Schrute cardinals as for super compact cardinals. So now we uh, again define such an um, such a collection such a collection where the sets are the ones where whenever you take such an embedding witnessing shrewdness, then the, the pointless image of um, the pre-image of the cardinal you're looking at, this is in the set. So you, the sets are large with respect to uh, these embeddings given by, by shrewdness. So this is now the same definition, but you just replace the Magidor embeddings with the shrewdness embeddings. Um, and then the same argument shows you that this is a normal filter. And again, you only use shrewdness to show that uh, the empty set is not in there. And again, the same argument shows you that if something satisfies the kappa CC, uh, then it's actually layered with respect to this forcing. Um, and one thing I should point out, I mean, for the to show you that the to show that the um, you have a regular suborder, it's important that the, the domain model is closed under small sequences. So this is used in this definition. Okay, but it's um, it's really the same argument as for super compactness, but it uses something much 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 weaker. So it's something that it can exist in L, right? So this answers these two questions. So um, so if you have a shrewd cardinal then you get these filters on all larger pickup alumnas where the capacity forcings are layered on. So in particular, the existence of such filters does not imply uh, some consistency, large consistency strength, and it's compatible with square everywhere because you can have these things in L. Okay, and actually, so for a long time, I tried to uh, get, um, a failure from of square from this filter layeredness, but uh, then I realized that it's you can get it from from these very weak properties. Okay, so this was something combinatorial, but now I want to show you another application of this uh, concept of shrewdness, and this is something called structural reflection, and. Uh, the idea is to use Magidor's result to look at strengthenings of the downward Lugman scolang theorem, where you not only reflect um, first order properties to some um, small sub model, but also external saturated properties of the model. And Sorry. if we will look at this, the following uh, principle introduced by Joan Bagaria. So we fix some cardinal kappa and some class of structures of the same type. And then this, the principle SR, so structural reflection for C and kappa. So this means that whenever we have um, some, some model in our class C, then we get an elementary embedding of some structure in this in this class that has size less than kappa right so but now the class c is given by it's just a saturated class right so you can write down all kinds of properties for, uh, and apply this principle yeah so whenever you have a large model you have a model of size less than kappa that's still in the class and you get an elementary embedding of the small um, model into the big one so that's structural reflection. Okay, and so so Joan showed that you always have this at uncountable cardinals and uh, sigma one definable classes, 
right? So this is just sigma one absoluteness basically. Uh, so this is really nothing too interesting, but it gets really interesting if you look at more complex classes. Um, so, and you get very large card, it, it corresponds with the existence of quite large cardinals as soon as you get uh, go beyond sigma one. Um, and you actually, you can characterize such cardinals in this way. Okay, so what is the uh, starting point here? So you get the following equivalence. So something is the least super compact cardinal, if and only if this principle SR, uh, C kappa holds um, for every sigma two definable class of structures. Um, and you you can have parameters in H kappa, but it's actually also equivalent when you just look at light phase um, uh, definable classes. Um, and, uh, and if you look at this for a while, this is really just um, a consequence of, um, of Magidor's embedding characterization. Because uh, I mean, the one class you should look at is the class of all V alphas, so that's sigma two definable, and sigma two formulas are absolute between um, V and these uh, large enough V alphas. So you get this by by using Magidor's result, and you can also uh, get more complex classes and larger cardinals by looking at sigma n plus two definable classes and uh, what Joan calls CN extendable cardinals. So for, for C1 extendable should just be extendable, right? So you, you get a nice characterization of, ex of the least extendable cardinal. Okay, but what I'm interested in now is the characterization of small large cardinals for this, I consider uh, a weakened principle introduced by Joan and Yoko Verenen, and this is called SR minus. So again, you have some cardinal and some class of structures, and then SR minus just restricts this principle of structural reflections, uh, reflection to structures of size kappa, right? So whenever you have something of size kappa in your class, there's an elementary embedding of some structure of size less than kappa. That's where the model is in the class. And uh, yes, so so it's a restriction of uh, S R C kappa to structures of size kappa. Um, and there's a paper um, by Joan and Yoko that kind of raises the question how you can characterize large cardinals using this S R minus principle. Um, and I will now show you some results that should, uh, tell us that there's a very narrow interval containing all um, cardinals that can be characterized with SR minus. And there are some interesting things going on, I think, in this, uh, in this uh, interval. So it's bounded from below by shrewdness and above by its subtleness. Okay. And so the, the starting point is the following result, which tells us there's nothing weaker than shrewdness that can be um, characterized. So we get the following equiconsistency over ZFC. So there is a shrewd cardinal, and there is a cardinal kappa such that SR minus holds for all sigma two definable classes. Um, so consistency-wise, this is the corresponds to the um, statement about uh, SR and supercompacts. Right? Um, but this now can be weakened to classes that are just uh, defined using stigma one formulas, but in the language extended by a predicate for cardinalities. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think uh, somebody. There is some, some feedback. Oh, uh, I think somebody, uh, I think has, somebody their has their mic their on. Mic on. So if we all turn if off, all our turn mics, off our mics, and then the feedback then will, the will, be will be gone. Gone. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you, um, yeah. So you also get make a consistency here where you just look at classes um, defined by these sigma one formulas in the extended language where you have a predicate for for cardinalities. And this is because so for uh, this proposition that I showed you says that for just sigma one formulas you get this reflection at all uncountable cardinals. So you have to do something stronger than sigma one here, and this is in some sense the, the least class that's bigger than the sigma one definable uh, uh, cl uh, collections. Okay, and so this is all equally consistent. So, and this tells us that um, just using SR minus, we cannot get something weaker than shrewdness. Okay. Um, okay, and now I will say a few words how to prove this. Okay, so this is just what I just said. So, um, so this should tell us that there's no reasonable characterization using SR minus for something weaker than um, shrewdness. Okay. And so now to, to prove this, we, we look at some natural weakening of shrewdness called weakly weak shrewdness. Um, and this is, okay, so let, let me show you this definition. So, so I say something is weakly shrewd whenever I take some subsaturated formula and some larger cardinal theta and some subset of kappa. So now this is now a subset of kappa and not of Lee kappa. And uh, I assume that this statement holds in this H theta. Then there are cardinals kappa bar uh, less than theta bar, such that kappa bar is less than kappa. And this reflected statement, so this restricted statement here, so I intersect A with kappa bar and I replace kappa by kappa bar. So this now holds in H theta bar. Okay, so if you compare this with the definition of the Schrute cardinal, then so there are three differences. <laughs> so first of all, I look, now look at subsets of kappa and I replace V theta by H theta, but I also removed the assumption that this uh, initial segment where I reflect to is uh, shorter than uh, kappa. So this theta bar here might be bigger than kappa. Okay, and this is, gets a bit clearer if I show you the, the embedding characterization for this. Um, so now this is, basically the same result is for shrewdness. The only difference is that I no longer assume that uh, theta bar is smaller than kappa, All right? So if you look at the picture, then it's somewhat the same picture, but now uh, this initial segment on the left might be taller than, than, than kappa. It's still small. I mean, it will usually have size kappa bar, but it might contain something above kappa. Um, and this is somehow, there's a very similar notion introduced by Trevor Wilson called uh, for remarkable cardinals, which he calls weakly remarkable. And you get it in the same way. So you take the one of the embedding characterization for remarkable cardinals, the Magido style characterization and you remove the assumption that uh, the domain model is uh, as high less than the, the cardinal. So you allow something larger. Okay, so this is now the picture you should have in mind for weakly shrewd cardinals. Um, okay. And now this is closely related to um, structural reflection. And it even turns out that weakly shrewd cardinals can be characterized by uh, this principle SR minus, because we now have the same, uh, the 
analog result of the super compactor. So something is the least weakly shrewd cardinal. If it's the least cardinal, where SR minus holds for all sigma two definable classes. Yeah, and you always get the, so from the large cardinal, you always get the, uh, this structural reflection principle. And for the least one where the structural reflection principle holds, you get the large cardinal property. Okay, and so in particular, using this other theorem that I showed you, Shrewd cardinals and weakly shrewd cardinals are equally consistent. I mean, just from the definitions, all shrewd cardinals are weakly shrewd, and then you can go back using these results. But it's somehow more complicated uh, relationship than say between uh, weakly and strongly inaccessible. So you cannot just uh, add cone reals to a, to a weakly shrewd cardinal. Um, to, uh, to a shrewd cardinal to get a weakly shrewd cardinal. So there you have to be a bit careful there. Um, Philip, can I yes. just ask, uh, so, so this, these characterizations, they work always for the least uh, cardinal with some large cardinal property. Yes. So I wonder what's known, like and it doesn't seem to work in general then, but like, where does it so, break down? <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, um, so the idea would be like for, I think for super compact limits of super compact should also have this property, um, right? Okay. Uh -huh. um, but you can, what I can actually show is, um, so if you look at this result for, for weekly shoots, if um, zero sharp does not exist, then all the reflection points are weekly shoot cardinals. Yeah, so you're okay. to get like these, Basically, singular limits of reflection points that are also reflection points. It's this has strength. This is quite strong. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Um, I think, but the idea should be that I guess it should be should be trivial that limits of supercompacts have this property, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And okay. But you I kind agree. of yeah, but. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't talk about this, but somewhere in my paper, I proved that without zero sharp, you actually get an equivalence between these things. Um, awesome. Very, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. And I think there are very similar results for where you look at model theoretic properties of strong logics, like Lumen school and Tarski numbers and so on. And there's always a equivalence for the least instances. Uh, I think something like Lovenite school and Tarski numbers for second order logic that should be the least super compact. So, and then above there's a similar thing where you always get the reflection property from the large cardinal, but you might have it at limits uh, uh, without being a large cardinal. So, um, oh. Okay, so okay, so this tells us that shrewd cardinals and weakly shrewd cardinals are equally consistent, but there's a, the relationship is a bit more complicated as for, say, weak and strong inaccessibility. Um, okay, so now this motivates two questions. Um, so what about stronger large cardinals? So you cannot really characterize something below shrewdness. So, so what about things above shrewdness? And the other thing is, um, so I can already, uh, I should tell you that weakly shrewd cardinals uh, are only weakly inaccessible. So they can be smaller than the continuum. Um, so uh, the question is, can you use this principle as a minus to, to get something that's strongly inaccessible? Um, and both of these questions are closely related to uh, the existence of weakly shrewd cardinals that are not shrewd. I don't really have a name for them. So I will always say weakly shrewd, but not shrewd. So <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, and it turns out, and this is very similar to this result about uh, remarkable cardinals and uh, weakly remarkable cardinals, that this um, closely related to sigma two reflection. So if you have a weakly short cardinal, then 
it's root if and only if it's not sigma two reflecting. And this is equivalent to the existence of a uh, sigma two definable ordinal above or cardinal uh, above the, the, the weakly shrewd cardinal. Okay, so um, if you are weakly shrewd but not shrewd, then something above it will be sigma two definable. And so, what is the picture for this? This is also quite nice. So, you let's say you have this definable ordinal here, and you take such an embedding where it's in the range. So then it has a pre-image, but the pre-image satisfies the same sigma two statement, and sigma two statements are upward absolute. So this pre-image has to be the same ordinal. So it's a fixed point. Um, so you are weakly shrewd, but not shrewd. If you have these embeddings where if you go high enough, you get fixed points. And this is quite strong. Um, I mean, it's not really strong. Uh, it's stronger than, than shrewdness, right? Uh, so all of this is an error. So when I say it's strong, <laughs> uh, yeah. OK. Um, but you can do nice things with these fixed points. So, so for example, we can talk about the consistency strength of weakly shrewd cardinals that are not shrewd. So first of all, if you have such a cardinal, then you get some uh, larger ordinal that's inaccessible in L and this weakly shrewd but not shrewd cardinal is shrewd in this initial segment of L, right? So, uh, so if you are weakly shrewd but not shrewd, then you get a, a set size model with something that's shrewd. So it's strictly stronger. And in the other direction, uh, if you take the least subtle cardinal, and now this is sigma two definable, if you look at it, um, so it will be a fixed point of these embeddings. Uh, so the least subtle cardinal is a stationary limit of inaccessible weakly shrewd cardinals that are not shrewd. Uh, and you should compare this with Ratian's result about getting shrewd cardinals from subtle cardinals. So in his result, um, the cardinals were shrewd in the initial segment of V where you cut off at the subtle cardinal. And so these things, they are subtle in there, but they are uh, weakly subtle and not shrewd, uh, weakly shrewd and not shrewd in V. Okay, so subtle cardinals are an upper bound for these things. And now we can look at the different reasons why weakly shrewd cardinals are not shrewd and they are all equally consistent. So it's having an inaccessible weakly shrewd cardinal that's not shrewd, that's the same as having a weakly shrewd cardinal you know, that's not inaccessible. And that's also the same as having a weakly shrewd cardinal below the uh, continuum. And uh, so the idea here is when you take a weakly shrewd cardinal that's not shrewd, and say it's inaccessible, then you get this definable point uh, above it. And if you add that many colon reals, then you will stay weakly shrewd. So then you can lift these embeddings. Uh, so you have to be careful how many colon reals you add uh, to preserve weak shrewdness. Okay, so these things are all equiconsistent. And now we can look at reflection properties. And okay, so this statement now is quite technical, but uh, I will try to describe what's going on. So basically the idea is if you have a shrewd cardinal that's not shrewd, then you not only get sigma two reflection, but you get sigma n reflection. So uh, you can go as high as you want in terms of complexity. So this tells us that using SR minus, you cannot just characterize something stronger than weakly shrewd, not shrewd. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's take our weekly shrewd cardinal that's not shrewd, and then we get this definable cardinal delta above it, so sigma two definable. And now for every complexity, so for all, all n, there is some cardinal below this delta where this SR minus holds for all um, sigma n formulas. Yeah, so you, 
get reflection for all complexities. But the way you derive it, you don't get one cardinal where it holds, but for the different complexities, you might get different cardinals. So this is just because of the limitations of first order logic. Right? So you cannot really get one thing where it reflects to. Um, but in a slightly different setting, so if zero sharp does not exist and the cardinal you're looking at is inaccessible, so, uh, so this will be always be equiconsistent to weakly shrewd cardinal that's not shrewd. You can add inaccessible without adding consistency strength. Then you get a set size model where you have reflection for all complexities for one fixed cardinal. So there is some inaccessible cardinal um, in between, where in this initial segment of the universe, you get SR minus uh, for all classes defined in uh, this initial segment um, for this one cardinal, right? So you, you get a, a set size model where you have sort of this maximal local reflection. Okay, and now just to, to present this in a nicer way, um, so, I mean, we have to like, we talk about arbitrary complexities here. So you have to um, add something to the language of set C. So let's add a constant symbol for the cardinal we're looking at. And then we uh, let SR minus N denote the statement that this principle SR minus holds for all Sigma N definable classes. So this is just one sentence because you can use a universal Sigma N formula. Um, okay, so, and now if that FC plus there's a weakly shoot kernel that's not shoot, if this is consistent, then uh, you get a, so this theory actually proves the existence of a transitive set size model where you have reflection, this principle SR minus for arbitrary complexities for this one cardinal uh, kappa dot. Right, so, um, Philip, yeah. could, could I just ask, um, I'm a little confused about the, uh, the, what, this, what this means. So when you say the class is definable by a sigma n formula, yes. couldn't, couldn't you, I mean, couldn't you define, could you, couldn't you put in the, into the definition, for example, that uh, the cardinality of the universe of every such thing is say omega one or omega two or something like that. Like if everything in this class yeah, yeah. has the same cardinality, then doesn't it trivially fail this reflection? I mean, no, no, no. I mean, then, uh, I mean, the, the model you start with in your reflection principle is the, it's a small sub model, then the embedding is just the identity, right? You say for every model, there's a small sub model. But if every model is small, then you can just take the model you started with. Oh, so I see. So it says for every. Uh... Oh, I mean, if you say, okay, if you look at SR minus, then if there are no models of size kappa, then this statement holds trivially, right? Because then you, the, the quantifier uh, is just. Um, yeah, now I'm confused. What does this SR minus of kappa say again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Um, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. So for every, so you have this class C of structures. Okay. And uh -huh. so for every structure of size kappa, there is something in, in the class of size less than kappa which embeds into it. Okay. So the, basically the, the important example of such structures is, if you look at the picture, are these elementary submodels, right? You say, so for sigma two. So you, you look at uh, structures where you say there is some, some cardinal theta where this thing is an elementary submodel of H theta. And then mm -hmm. SR minus for this 
gives you these embeddings, right? Because you, you take your edge data, you take a submodel of size kappa, and then you reflect it to something small, and this will give you this embedding here. Right. Yeah, so for, so for SR, we say arbitrary large models have small submodels. The other examples are just the initial segments of the universe. Right, and then you get this Magito embeddings. And for SR minus, the main example are small submodels or elementary submodels of initial segments of the universe. And once you get the reflection principle for them, you get these embeddings that witness weak shrewdness. Right. So, so you would, so it like uh, what I had in mind was the possibility of having a class of structures, all of which have size kappa. But not this empty cannot class. happen. Th this ca I mean, this, this I mean, okay, was... this, um, so let's see. So you you allow only parameters from H kappa. Okay. Yeah. And. Um, but it could theoretically still be that kappa is the smallest uh, thing with some property that's definable, no? Yeah, but uh, I mean, um, I mean, the, the shrewdness will tell you that kappa is not sigma two definable. I mean, if you okay. if you look at this this embeddings, then if kappa satisfies some sigma two definition, then the preimage satisfies it too, right? So you. But but now you were talking uh, about sigma n definability for arbitrary n in the last. Slide. Yes, but then you uh, you get um, you get uh, let's see um, uh, so it's not in V, right? You get some model where you uh, sorry, I was like I was here, right? Um. Yeah, so this mm -hmm. this kappa will not be definable in this model in any way. Okay. So you you allow parameters from H kappa. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I mean, um, yeah. So you always change models when you get this model uh, with a maximal reflection. Okay. I mean. Uh, so in this technical thing, I mean, one thing is you get this, so I said, if you have this weakly shoot, not shoot, then you get this reflection points for all complexities, but the cardinals are different, right? Um, so, and your argument has it that this cardinal will change if kappa was definable in a sigma n way. Um, okay. Okay, but I mean, just by compactness, uh, this result here tells you that you get some model where you have one point with arbitrary strong reflection properties, right? Because it, this tells you that it's consistent for every finite, for every sigma n. And then if you just use the compactness theorem, you will get a model where you have one cardinal where it's, it holds for arbitrary complexities. Mm -hmm. But the model is a different one. Okay, okay, I get it now. Okay, right. Yeah. yeah. So Thank it's, you. Mm -hmm. and the same here. You you change the model so you go to some v epsilon, mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah. But you're right. The the kappa will be highly indescribable, mm -hmm. and I okay. guess that's the idea of shrewdness. <laughs> that, right. Uh, it's in some form maximal. Uh, as question. question. Yeah. Uh, please the accessibility of that cardinal epsilon. Um, why does that just sort of pop out that there's a, or uh, in this, a larger inaccessible? Um, the, the second statement here. Is, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Why, why Where you, does epsilon come from? Uh, you look at the least reflected. So, if you are uh, weakly shrewd but not shrewd, then there's this definable point above it. Mm -hmm. And this will be fixed by the embeddings. And you look at the least fixed point. 
And there, there you actually use the fact that Kappa itself is inaccessible and you have to use this uh, non-existence of zero sharp uh, to, to get that um, the least fixed point is inaccessible. And the thing where I use zero sharp doesn't exist is that it gives you, if the least fixed point was singular, then you get a sigma two definable cofinal sequence because then it's singular in L and you can use the least cofinal sequence in L. But then the, the, um, the cofinality of this will be fixed by the embedding and you get a smaller fixed point. So th these assumptions are just because I can prove it using those assumptions and it's, <laughs> it's okay to assume them because if zero sharp exists then you get basically everything you want. But um, yeah, so the, the epsilon is the least fixed point of some embedding of this form. And then you have to show that it's inaccessible. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And um, okay. So so if you have uh, just that weakly shoot and not shoot, this gives you a set size model where you have one point um, where you have this SR minus principle for uh, all complexities. And this is somehow some weak local version of Popenka's principle, right? So uh, if you have SR for arbitrary large cardinals and arbitrary complexities, then this is Popenka's principle. So, um, so this is some very weak version of this, but it's, you can have this and you can have it in L, right? And you can have it um, below the continuum. Um, okay, now the second part is, so now, so this, this theory here, this is strictly stronger than this theorem, but they are equally consistent if you add the assumption that the cardinal you're looking at is smaller than the continuum, right? So, um, uh, so weakly shoot plus not shoot, uh, it's the same as one cardinal below the continuum where this SR minus holds for all complexities. Okay. <laughs> so, and this should answer those two questions that I posed. So basically nothing that's stronger than weakly shoot and not shoot uh, can be characterized by SR minus. And you cannot characterize things that are strongly inaccessible because you always have these things below the continuum. I don't know, you always have them, you can have them. Um, so, I mean, the, the, of course, the continuum is extremely large in those models. So I guess the, the, the main example is to take a subtle cardinal and add that many cone wheels, and then you have these points below the continuum that, are, that have these reflection properties. Um, but you can have them, which I think is quite interesting. Um, okay. Okay, so now I want to briefly say something about uh, smaller, large, uh, even smaller large cardinals. And so we want to characterize things like weakly inaccessible, weakly malo uh, by reflection principles. And Okay, so we already know that we cannot use like complexities from the Levy hierarchy because if you sigma for sigma one classes is it's uh, trivial, so you get it for all uncountable cardinals, and as soon as you add the predicate for cardinalities, which is in some way the the least uh, complex pi one predicate, uh, then you you already get uh, shrewdness. Uh, and we already know that you cannot imply strong, like, you cannot characterize something that implies strong inaccessibility. So we should look at uh, things that can ex that only imply weak inaccessibility. And this is what I will mean by large cardinal properties. So something that implies weak inaccessibility. Okay. So so we now have to introduce some complexity between sigma one and sigma two. 
And this is uh, what I call uniform local sigma n definability. I mean, it's a bit uh, technical, but so what we look at is we we flick we uh, pick some class R and some complexity n, and then we say some class is uniformly locally sigma n R definable in some parameter. If we have a um, a formula in this language extended by a predicate, uh, language of set theory extended by this predicate. And whenever I take some cardinal where H kappa contains this parameter, then the intersection of my class that's uniformly locally definable with H kappa plus is just everything in H kappa plus such that the given formula holds in H kappa plus. Okay, so what is the idea behind this? So this is, a, if you look at sigma one formulas, then sigma one definable is the same as uniformly locally sigma one definable because of sigma one absoluteness, right? Because it's, it's H kappa uh, plus they are sigma one correct. Uh, but now if you, increase the complexity and you add this predicate, then you get something stronger. Um, but as long as this predicate is pi one definable, uh, these classes will be sigma two definable in V yeah, because H kappa plus is uh, uh, pi one definable. Um, okay, and it's, strictly weaker than sigma two definable because you get a sigma two definable truth predicate for H kappa plus and this cannot be locally definable. So this gives you things in between. Uh, okay, so this is uniformly local, locally definable. And now we have to define our local classes using this. So we take some predicate R and some class set of parameters. And then we say a local sigma in R class. This is something where the class is closed on our isomorphic copy. So this is kind of, it's a an, um, natural assumption. And in particular, you should see that if something is sigma n definable, then the closure on our isomorphic copies is also sigma n definable because you just say there is something in the class and there's an isomorphism and this won't um, give you a new complexity. So you're close on the isomorphic copies and you are uniformly locally with sigma n definable. So it means that there's some formula, sigma n r formula. So the intersection with this class with H kappa plus is just the things that satisfy the formula in H kappa plus. Okay, and now this allows us to characterize various small cardinals. So for example, we are weakly inaccessible if and only if SR minus holds for local sigma one classes with a cardinality predicate. And so you, you have this predicate that says something is a cardinal. So in this sense, uh, weakly inaccessible corresponds to the cardinality predicate. Um, and we get the same thing for weakly Marlow, where the correspondence now is the, with the predicate for regular cardinals. So something is weakly Marlow if and only if um, we have SR, uh, SR minus for the cardinal and all local sigma one regularity predicate classes. So Marlon is, it's kind of obvious, that it, and it's not obvious, but it, uh, it's uh, the obvious pick to pick the regularity predicate for, for Marlon is. And now we can get something stronger. And now so the next thing would be the weak version of weakly compact, but I mean, weakly compact, uh, so they're, they're not called weak weakly compact. Uh, so this was introduced by Levy. So they are weekly pi one one uh, indescribable. 
and weakly indescribable. So this is, uh, yeah, it's maybe not so easy to read, but if you know the definition of indescribable, take this definition and replace D kappa by kappa. And then you allow more parameters with different arities so you, you can do coding. Uh, but what you get is weakly indescribable. And so if you are inaccessible, then weakly indescribable is the same as indescribable because you can code V kappa into kappa. Um, but if you're not inaccessible, then it's something uh, something different. <laughs> okay, so, so it's the definition of indescribable. So you take some, some pi mn statement for pi mn indescribable that holds in the structure kappa and then predicates and these predicates can have various arities. So you, so you can actually take predicates that code something. Um, and then there's something smaller where this pi and n statement holds in the restricted structure. Okay, and then uh, pi one n in the scribe, weekly pi one n in the scribe hardness. This is the same as, uh, or the, the least ones are the same as the ones that the least ones that satisfy SR minus for local sigma n plus one classes. And uh, this proof is quite messy because you you have to translate pi mn formulas into tetrahedric formulas, but it's 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 not hard, but it, it it's just ugly to write down. But um, but what is interesting is that this again uses embedding characterizations of fragments of weak shrewdness. So in some form, all of these cardinals, like weakly inaccessible, weakly malo, weakly indescribable, they can be viewed as some restricted form of shrewdness, of weak shrewdness, where you just restrict the parameters. And the easiest way to show this is by looking at the embedding characterization and the one for weak pi one one indescribability is the following. So something is weakly pi one one indescribable. So now you, uh, so you only look at substructures of um, uh, boop, 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 boop. Um, oh, okay, sorry, it's uh, sorry. So you again, you take some some larger theta, and now, so it, it doesn't really matter. So this is basically the same as this axis before, but it's if you collapse it, if you take the transitive collapse, and it's it's the same because all that matters is the h critical point plus of these models, and you get some embedding. Um, where the critical point is sent to kappa and this parameter is in the range. But now the H critical point plus of this domain model is sigma one correct. So it's a sigma one elementary submodel of the real H crit J plus. Okay, and this is the embedding characterization of weekly pi one one indescribable. So you get this Magador characterization. And the thing is that the domain model is sigma one correct at the, uh, at the critical point. Um, okay, there's something nice you can do with this. And this relates to something Hemkins called the weekly compact embedding property. Okay, let me tell you what this is. Uh, so, I can in fact show that this property is the same as weak pi one one indescribability. So what Joel defined is that a cardinal kappa has a weakly compact embedding property. If whenever you take a, a transitive set M of cardinality kappa that contains kappa, uh, then you get some transitive set N and some elementary embedding from N to N with this critical point. Okay, but so, um, what is interesting is that if you start with a weakly compact cardinal and you add kappa plus many cone reals, then you will uh, still have this property in the forcing extension. So it doesn't imply weak compactness. Right? Um, 
But in fact, this embedding characterization that I showed you uh, shows that this property is actually the same as weak by one one indescribability. Um, okay, and I can briefly sketch one direction because it's not a hard proof once you have this embedding characterization. So if you want to get the weakly compact embedding property, so you start with some transitive set M and you want to get this embedding, right? Um, okay, so take your set, this transitive set M and place it into the range of such an embedding, right? So then it has a pre-image in, in this model M, uh, which is again a transitive set. But now the restriction of J uh, to this transitive set, it's an elementary sub, uh, it's an elementary embedding from this transitive set to some other transitive set uh, where the critical point is the critical point of J. Okay, and the statement, there is such an embedding, it's a sigma one statement, which only uses this, uh, pre-image of the transitive set as a parameter. Okay, and this sigma one statement, it holds in here, right? Okay, so it holds in here, right? So you get this embedding in the domain of this, this embedding here. So you can map it to edge theta and there it witnesses the weakly compact embedding property, right? So, you, so the idea is that this, uh, the relevant statement in the definition of the weakly compact embedding property, this is a sigma one statement with parameter M. Okay, so uh, these two things are actually the same. Um, and the other direction is also not half. But, um, so the, the, the only messy part is showing that weak pi one one indescribability is characterized by these embeddings because then you have to do some translation of pi one one statements into pi one statements over h kappa plus and, uh, but it's also not not deep it's just um, technical okay and now i want to say one final thing and this is related to this weak weakly compact embedding property so there's some unpublished work by uh, Cody, Cox, Hemkins, and Johnson. And they what they do is they show that cardinals with this weakly compact embedding property, they are not cardinal invariants of the continuum or the other way around, this property fails for cardinal invariants, right? So remember in this, uh, so Hemkins showed that if you add kappa plus many cone wheels to a weakly compact cardinal kappa, then you um, uh, still have this property. So in particular, so you, you don't have it at the continuum, but at the predecessor of the continuum. Okay, and I can use this structural reflection business and this shrewdness uh, characterization to put this into a slightly more general context. And I will phrase this in a very general way. So, Let's take some class of cardinals. Then there is a class of structures such that this reflection principle SR minus fails for the minimum of the class. Okay, this is very trivial because you just take structures for the empty language whose cardinality is in this class, right? So, and then of course, if you do it, if you look at the minimum, then it cannot reflect to something smaller because it was the minimum. Right? Okay, but now um, if this class of cardinals was sigma and R definable, then this class of structures will be sigma one and R definable. And the same for uniform local sigma and R definability. Okay, so uh, if you have this class of cardinals that's definable in a certain way, then um, the minimum of this class will not have the corresponding structural reflection property. Okay, but now if you look at singleton the continuum, 
my daughter is going to bed. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's some drama going on. Um, okay. Um, okay, so if you look at the singleton of the continuum, the interval from the bounding number to the continuum or from the dominating number to the continuum, then these things are all uniformly locally sigma 2 definable. Uh, this is really not hard. You just have to look at the definition means and how these cardinal invariants are, de are defined. Okay, but now the continuum B and D, these are the minima of these, uh, of these sets. So this means that the structural reflection will fail for uniformly locally sigma two definable classes. So in particular, the minima of these sets are not um, weekly pi one one um, indescribable, right? Because pi one one indescribability gives you this SR minus uh, for the cardinal and these classes, right? So, but now weekly, um, the weak embedding, uh, weekly compact embedding property was the same as weak pi one one indescribability. So this is another way of showing that these cardinals do not have the weakly compact embedding property, but it also shows the same thing for a stronger um, um, reflection properties. So, and for other things that are definable, right? So, um, so for example, if you look at, um, at sigma two definable um, classes and you have some cardinal a successor cardinal that's sigma two definable, then the predecessor will also be sigma two definable, right? So if you have these reflection properties for full sigma two definability, then also these cardinals cannot be the predecessor of the continuum um, for finitely many steps and boundedly many, right? So kind of these, these cardinals, they have to be highly indescribable. Uh, so this, saying that cardinal invariants of the continuum do not have the weakly compact embedding property. This is just one instance of this phenomena that um, uh, definable cardinals do not have reflection properties. Okay, and I think this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, are there any, any more questions? We had a lot of questions already, but uh, um, maybe some people have more. Um, Philip, I have a question. Um, yep. Do you know what the relationship is between shrewd cardinals and strongly unfoldable cardinals? It's a good question. I was. It reminded me of that too, strong unfoldability. Yes. It's somehow mm -hmm. similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, so let's see. So a weekly, uh, 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 I think I actually don't. Know. I mean, what's uh, uh, is there a relationship somehow? How do they relate to remarkable cardinals? So they're in the right range. They are below subtle. They're kind of mini super compact, but in a different way from remarkability. Uh, so you have, I mean, essentially you have an elementary embedding J on, um, on a Kappa model uh, whose, whose range can, uh, can contain arbitrarily large H theta. Yeah. So to me, this looks like it maybe might even end up being a quiver. I don't know. I mean, it's certainly in the right neighborhood strength-wise. Yeah. Um, I, I I mean, I would have to think about it, but it looks plausible. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I, I remember, I, I thought the definition looked very similar, actually. And there's this paper by Miyamoto where he introduces, uh, uh, he doesn't call it unfoldable, right? Um, he characterizes these bounded uh, forcing axioms and uh, 
and somehow unfoldable is, so to speak, the first level in a hierarchy of large cardinals that he introduces there. Um, so that, that all looks very, very similar somehow. So yeah, something yeah. to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's actually somewhere on Wikipedia that the relationship between um, strongly unfoldable and fruit is not known or so. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, somewhere, I mean, I've uh, actually, I found the definition of fruit on Wikipedia because I was looking for large cardinal notions in this region and yeah. Uh, okay. So the relationship is not known. Okay, that's surprising. I mean, I just I mean, maybe, easy yeah, maybe, it, but, but it's just somehow, uh, somehow um, I should look at it again. I think it's, uh, might also say there are no results on this. Um, so it doesn't really look like someone really worked on this. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, when you when you defined uh, this weak, weakly indescribable, it, yeah. I just I just figured you know one th simple way to think of it is like you just replace H kappa with L kappa, you know in the or you take the original definition of uh, indescribability, but instead of H kappa you take L kappa because then you automatically you have something of size kappa. And yeah. uh, you have your closed underordered pairs, and you don't have to worry yeah. about coding and anything like that. It's a yeah. nice, simple way to yeah. think of it, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's kind of obvious that it's the same, right? Because you, if you just allow the the, the cardinal as a parameter, then you can just take a bijection. Yeah, you could code the absolute a, relation on L kappa, yeah. and yeah. 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 Yeah, that's true. Uh, any further questions or comments? Okay. Well, thanks again. That was a great talk. Um, yeah. Thanks. For thanks. Me. That was super, super interesting. Yeah. Thanks.